Greetings, crabs. Welcome back to Disenthrall. I am Patrick Smith. So I was watching Jordan Peterson's interview with Joe Rogan, and there was a four-minute clip that was just so jam-packed with wisdom that I think would be useful to us that I wanted to highlight it here on the channel with a little bit of commentary to more directly relate it to a lot of what our viewers um, are involved with. So uh, there's, there's three sections of this that I want to comment on. Let's just go ahead and jump right into this. And I think he did. did no, he I don't leave? think I don't think he left. I don't think he left, but, but she did. Seeing him bow down to this woman screaming at him, swearing yeah. in his face was so disturbing. It was so humiliating. I felt so humiliated for him because she was screaming, this is our home. What the fuck are you doing? You're not making this safe. And it's not safe. a bloody home. The university is not a home. Right. It's not a safe space. It's not a secure space. None of that. And and if, if that, when a, a university isn't a home, that's not what it is. It's a place to be confronted by, I would say, often horrible ideas. You want to learn about history? You think that's going to be safe? Do you know what human history is like? It's an endless bloodbath with, you know, with, with a certain amount of hopeful progress underlying it. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horror show. And great literature is like that. And, and, and biology is terrifying. And physics is terrifying. And you want to be safe. It's stay home. Stay home with your mom. Stay home with your dad. Don't come to university if you want to be safe. Because don't even you, go outside. No, I don't know if you if you're going if the university is going to make you safe, then it ceased to be a university. So the first thing that struck me was the similarity with uh, participating in philosophical discussions. So there was a quote, and I don't remember the exact quote. I couldn't find it, but the gist of it was this: uh, walking into a philosopher's classroom is very much like walking into a hospital to see a doctor for treatment. You are entering a place for the purposes of subjecting yourself to sometimes very uncomfortable, intrusive, painful experiences for the purposes of making yourself whole, for the purposes of healing yourself. Because the treatment for a lot of damage is very painful, uncomfortable, invasive. And I thought that was an amazing association for the same thing we do when we participate in philosophy, when we work through these ideas. We don't spend our time discussing the easy stuff like, you know, how to play ball fairly. We spend our time discussing some of the most uncomfortable, disgusting edge case scenarios that are very difficult to think about clearly and rationally and reasonably and, and uh, to sort of separate ourselves from the strong emotions that are triggered when we do this philosophy work. And the same thing can be said for self-work. I think there's a lot of similarities between studying and learning philosophy and self-work, uh, but that's a discussion for a different time. The point I wanted to relate to what he said was that, that when you, when you step into the university of philosophy and you start studying and trying to learn and expand your thinking and heal yourself and doing self-work, it's very uncomfortable. And if, if you're encountering a philosopher or a teacher, let's just say a teacher, if you're encountering somebody that's teaching you something and the experience is blissful and it feels amazing and there's no struggling and it's just easy and it's obvious, you know, it seems obvious. I see that as a red flag. I, I am taken aback when I have that experience because there's a chance that what they're doing is not philosophy. It's not medicine, to use the example from before. It's not that doctor interaction that, that gives you the experiences you need rather than the ones that you want. So I think that's an important lesson to learn when you're interacting with people that are, you know, setting themselves up as an authority or as an instructor or a teacher and what they're teaching and talking with you about and the work that they're doing with you is not in any way uncomfortable or difficult. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's a case where it's not a red flag, but I think we, I think we need to be careful and cautious. So let's move on. So one of the things I try to do in my class, I have this class called Maps of Meaning, which concentrates on atrocity, basically on Soviet atrocity and, and Nazi atrocity mostly. 
And what I try to do in the class is to teach my students that had they been in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, they would have been Nazis. And had they been op offered the opportunity to be an Auschwitz, Auschwitz camp guard, then maybe they would have leapt at it. And maybe they would have been in the sadistic, uh, in the more sadistic proportion of the Auschwitz camp guard population. You think that makes you feel safe? It doesn't make you feel safe to know that Nazis were humans and you happen to be one of them. And so I think that this is uh this is an important point for us as voluntarists interacting with the world at large who are mostly not voluntarists and have no conception of anything that we're talking about and the gun in the room of government is totally invisible and it's just a matter of course that you know of course we vote in politicians that create laws that coercively control people and that's just totally invisible to them you have to have this for me, you know, he's talking to his students. And for me, this lesson is one of empathy. It's one of remembering that you as a voluntarist with the knowledge that you have and the uh, maybe the wokeness that you have achieved through a lot of difficult and painful self-work. Don't imagine yourself to just be automatically now above everyone else. Like if you and the point that this is making here, and this is something that you should apply to like almost every single scenario in your life when you're applying judgments to other people. And I'm not saying not to make judgments, but I think you should make your judgments with empathy. So I just wanted to qualify that I, anytime you're in a scenario where someone else is behaving in a, in, in a, a, a non, let's say voluntarist way in an unprincipled way or in a bad way, even. Granted, you need to judge that behavior because that is what, you know, being a moral principle person is. Apply that judgment. Yes, sure. But remember that by you having the knowledge that you do and the wisdom that you do, you are not above that person. You are not some kind of ubermensch, like, you know, new human. Uh, you are a human that has encountered things in your life that has led you to go looking for and to understand the things that you do now. They aren't. They haven't been yet. Maybe you are the one, maybe you are the thing in their life that introduces them to the stuff that you were introduced to. And had you been born in their home with their life and their influences and their interactions and their experiences and difficulties and life story, you would be in their position doing the things that they're doing. That's not a certain, that's not an absolute, but it's definitely very likely. The same thing, you know, it, it's kind of the same thing when people say, you know, if you had been born... In Iraq, you'd most likely be a Muslim. If you, you know, were born in southern Texas, you're most likely a Christian of, of some flavor or another. The, your, your circumstances determine, to a large degree, your starting point and a lot of your story. And so we have to remember, it's a, it's a point of empathy. It's, yes, judge, judge things that happen. You, that, is, that is your job as a moral agent, is to apply judgments and behave accordingly. But in that process, it's real easy for humans to, you know, get that kind of nose in the air. Well, I know the non, I know about the non-aggression principle and I know that that behavior is immoral. And, uh, you know, that makes me a better form of human. I think, um, I think that's easy to fall into for some, uh, certainly me at certain points. And, uh, this is a good reminder that positions reversed positions would also be reversed. So judge with empathy. Maybe that's the summary. Let's move on. So I think that educators that tell students that they're offering them a safe space are doing them a profound disservice. And you don't, I'm a clinical psychologist and here's one of the things you do to make people less afraid. You don't make the world safer. What you do is you, people tell you what they're afraid of and then you break it into little bits so that they can go confront them. You know, so maybe they're afraid of going to a party and you break that down and you say, well, do you know how to introduce yourself? And they say, well, I don't, I don't really even know how to shake someone's hand. And so then you practice having them shake their hand and introduce themselves because maybe they weren't taught by that by their half-witted parents when they, were, when they were young because they were ignored. And so then you say, well, maybe you can go to a party for half an hour and all you have to do is introduce yourself to two people and we'll call that success. And you build up their competence and their confidence one step at a time. And what happens, the, the clinical literature indicates quite clearly, is you don't make people less anxious by doing that. You make them braver. It's not the same thing. 
You don't make the world and its horrors smaller. You make the person and their, their, their capacity to deal with horror larger. You encourage them. You strengthen them. That's what you do at a university. You arm people with arguments. You, you hone their intellect. You, you help them learn to write so they can marshal their arguments. You, you help them learn how to engage in intellectual combat because that's better than engaging in real combat. You make them, you make them hard and strong. You don't mollycoddle them and make them safe unless you're their enemy, unless you're trying to devour their spirit. And that's what we have in the universities. We have, we have the reign of the Oedipal mother who's, who's answered everything is, oh, just come a little closer, dear, and I'll protect you from the world. It's just like Hansel and Gretel's, the, you know, the, the, the witch in the Hansel and Gretel story. Well, my house is made of gingerbread. Just come in here and everything will be fine. Well, she feeds you candy to fatten you up so she can eat you. That's the archetype of a modern university. So the lesson that I find to be important from this, again, it's, it's about how we can improve ourselves. It's don't subject yourself. Don't, um, subject is the wrong word. Don't keep yourself or allow yourself to remain in environments that don't challenge you. Uh, in whatever domain that you're interested in, if it's business, get, you know, make sure that you're not getting too comfortable in whatever line of work that you're doing, that you're, that you've stopped growing. If it's philosophy, make sure that you're not in an echo chamber, constantly check to make sure you're not in, in, in an echo chamber. And if you find yourself in one, shatter that, shatter that thing and get out and go find people with new arguments and new positions to challenge yourself with. The other thing that is important is that we we have to and this re, for me this was effort but uh, I, I'm there now it's when I find somebody with a, a position that challenges mine typically the more uh, the more quality or the the stronger the argument is that challenges my own positions the more we subconsciously emotionally steer away from it from even hearing that argument maybe we just put it off maybe we put it on our watch later list on youtube and we say oh that you know i you know i'm gonna i'm gonna listen to that but maybe later or maybe we start playing the video with the argument in it and you know as, as soon as we start hearing things that uh maybe are even a little bit wrong it's easy to pull that ripcord and be like oh, okay well i'm not gonna waste you know any more of my time because it sounds like he's you know already wrong. He's already going off the rails, something like that. It is so easy to just um, pull the ripcord and get out of, get away from uncomfortable arguments that might challenge ours. And the better they do at challenging ours, the more strongly we have an emotional bias against even hearing it, much less engaging with it. But when we do that as humans, it's almost like we're giving up the thing that makes us human. It's our market differentiator from every other species on this planet is our ability to reason and our ability to argue and debate and to seek rational truth. And I've success. I mean, I'm at a place now in my life. It can always change. It's always a thing you have to keep an eye on. But I've really got to a place right now where when I find an argument that is that seems strong or when i find a person that seems very rational and they disagree with me on something i genuinely get excited i genuinely seek them out like i go and i you know become like a, a little fanboy I, I it seems like i act like a fanboy but that's not the i mean that's not quite what i mean it's like i i go and i approach them constantly hey can we talk through this hey do you have time let's let's hop on discord let's get on voice chat or come on my show and we'll talk through it um, a good example is recently, um, there's a video that we put out recently on the truth about Steemit and the Tron attempt at taking over the, the Steam blockchain. And we had a, a brilliant guy on, very, very smart, sharp guy. You can tell just from listening to him talk that, you know, he's got some intelligence uh, in there. And he even went so far as to write articles about how cryptocurrency was not property. And that is a position that I very much disagree with, I think is false. I think that's wrong. And so when I found out that he had that point of disagreement with me, I mean, in the back of my mind, the whole show... And we were discussing Steam and Steamit and Tron and, you know, all the controversy or whatever. But in the back of my mind, the thing I'm really interested in, the thing I'm really waiting for is to get to engage with them on this thing that we disagree with. And when we finally got to that point, watch me in that video. It's like two thirds of the way through, like an hour and I don't know, 19 minutes or something. Watch me light up. That is the attitude that I really I, I, I suggest that you guys try and adopt when don't shy away from debates and discussions seek them out in a genuine kind way 
because that's how we grow. That's how we find truth. That's how we refine our positions. And if you have people that never want to do that, I'm not saying like, you know, disassociate from them, not saying that at all. I'm there's people that are just, that's their personality. They're not really interested. They're definitely, you know, they see it as conflict and they're not in a place in their life where they're ready for that kind of conflict. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. But at the same time, one must also kind of wonder, well, you know, if they're not really seeking out disagreements or discussions or debates to refine their position and to find more truth, it just kind of makes me question, and you can comment, you, you know, write in the comments if you disagree or what your thoughts are on this. But to me, it's just like a, a little piece of me is like, okay, well, if that's not the type of person they are that seeks out challenges to their positions and to, you know, fights in the, in the gutters of, you know, uh, rhetoric and debate and logic to find and refine truth. I mean, I, I, I can't, I, when they do make statements about what they think and believe and what, what they say is right. And when they say they found truth, it just makes me question. Yeah. It, it just make not, what am I trying to say? It's like you've, you can't value their opinions or positions quite as much because I mean, you, you kind of know that they haven't really challenged their own positions much anyway. So I guess the, the third part three summary on this was just to say, Make sure that you're not in an environment like he's describing for college campuses where you're molly coddled and where no one challenges you. Uh, and certainly, you know, don't seek out toxic environments where, you know, the, the form of debate that's in play is just, you know, shit talking and name calling and trolling. That's not what I mean either. Make sure that the environment you're in is one where healthy debate and disagreement is embraced and uh, where we're all moving forward in our ideas and our positions. Okay. So it just seemed that was, that was like a, le that was a three minute, 56 second clip from Jordan Peterson. And man, I just thought there was so much packed in there. I wanted to take it, expand on it and share it with you guys. So thanks for watching.